Welcome back to the Wrong Advice Podcast. I'm your host, John Picciuto, and I'm very, very excited to have the one and only Jacqueline Paris on with us today. Jackie, how the hell are you? I'm good. Thanks for inviting me. Oh my God, I'm so excited for this conversation. It's just such a wonderful, nostalgic blast from the past. Can you introduce yourself to the listeners? Yes. Yeah, so I'm John's classmate. <laughs> that's my most... That's my most successful credential is that <laughs> I graduated with John from high school. And um, ever since then, I've just been floating uh, aimlessly through life with almost zero direction. So I'm <laughs> hoping John can redirect me and find my path. Incredible. Oh, man. I, I So much to unpack there. So no pressure. what type of floating have you been doing for the last 20 years? <laughs> almost. <laughs> Wait, let's figure out when how long we haven't seen each other in. 18 years. Okay. I'm, I'm, it's my roundabout 2004 to 2022. I, I mean, did you go to the 10 year reunion? No. No. So I haven't seen you in 18 you knew, years. You knew the answer to that. Well, I didn't actually know the answer because I was extremely intoxicated that evening. Um, this, there's no way campus safety would have let me on. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't at school. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Um, no little golf cart. There's no way I would have gone through. <laughs> weren't you like our vice president or something? I'm not going to be offended by the fact that I was the student body president. President. And that you just, get my second most successful credential, you just demoted. Okay. Listen, you know, <laughs> it was 18 years ago. There have been a plethora of fried brain cells since then. And I do apologize for well, that's okay. belittling yes, your biggest body. high school accomplishment. I was <laughs> your student body president. Just mine, not everybody else's. Two terms. Two Serving terms. Junior and senior year. That is impressive. How did that look on the uh, the old college resume? Slash, where did you go to college? Slash, who are you and how did you get to where you're at in life? <laughs> okay, so um, I think the student body president thing probably gave a little a little boost and may have helped um, balance out some of the convictions. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I think it helped. I ended up at New York University. Oh, casual. I went to NYU. Yeah. Super low key. Not a great school at all. No, just, not, you not know. impressive at all. Nope. No. Um, <clears throat> I ended up there for pre-med because I don't oh. know if you remember, but I was an EMT in high school and I wanted to be a doctor. I did remember that. And so I went to NYU thinking that I was going to go to med school and mm -hmm. that was the dream. So I was in all of those huge lecture halls with like 300 kids doing bio one and gen chem and Orgo and the normal pre-med track. And you're not a doctor. So, I'm not. Things have gone terribly wrong. <laughs> no, I just think this sounds like a story there. So yes. you're in NYU doing all these massive lecture hall, horrible, boring classes. And yes. when did you change your mind about being a doctor? So um, I've talked about this a couple times to a lot of interns and um, young and emerging talent that I work with because I talk a lot about the nonlinear stumbling paths into the film industry. Mm. It just feels like nobody has a very linear path to where we are when we're in media. Um, yeah. And I was an EMT, I was a pre-med student, and I was a research assistant on a book um, about modern matern maternity care in America, kind of the horrors of modern maternity care in America. And I was working at St. Vincent's uh, Hospital in, on um, 14th and 7th Ave. And one of our patients walked in frequently she was a, having a chronic medical problem and she walked in all the time and I had to scan her insurance card. And uh, it was from the, MP, it was an MPI insurance card, Motion Picture Industry of America. Oh, wow. And that's where she got her health insurance. And I casually mentioned to her one day that I was a research assistant on a book about modern maternity care and that it would soon be the basis of a documentary feature. And just making small talk with her because I was like, interested, like, oh, it's going to, my research is going to end up in a film. Turns out she was a producer in need of some research for her next documentary about a neurodivergent teenager, a 14 year old boy with undiagnosed autism on ASD. And um, I ended up helping her on that and it just grew from there. I ended up as her coordinator ultimately. And then I want, went on to become an associate producer with her. And she worked at an independent documentary film company called Isotope Films. She was the owner, founder. Wait, I've heard of them. Yes. and. Um, they do a lot of amazing work yeah. and she's an amazing producer. And she had a small documentary independent shop located at the Tribeca Film Center. And that's where I worked. And I switched majors after my sophomore year. And I switched to the colleges that I was, I was 
inside the College of Arts and Science at NYU, and I transferred to Gallatin, which is the School of Individualized Study within NYU, where you can build your own major. Mm -hmm. And I switched, and I left medicine behind, and that was the last of that. Wow. And you were like, what, 20? Yes. Yep. I I would, yeah. I would, right after I, stuff right I'm super curious because like I didn't make this sort of massive life change until my 30s <clears throat> and I'm super curious like what that those conversations were like with your parents like your 20 pre-med yeah. NYU like the entirety yeah. of your life and career in front of you and you go hey mom hey dad I want to be in film I want to you know yeah. what was that conversation like I don't think they ever thought medicine was a great fit for me oh yeah so they're both in medicine in different ways. My mom is an occupational therapist with a lot of quads in rehab hospital settings. Mm-hmm. And then she switched to upper extremity injuries. My dad is a medical malpractice attorney. Mm-hmm. So I don't think either of them, I think a lot of, I like both of them saw a lot of the horrors of the med- medical industry and um, how we were practicing insurance-based medicine rather than practitioner-based medicine and yeah. how defensive medicine has become Um and I don't think either of them thought that was a good fit because my math and science scores always deeply lagged behind <laughs> my English and language arts skills and writing was always something I was passionate about. And I think they didn't understand why I was trying this in the first place. So I think when I switched, they were like, this makes more sense. We've always kind of felt like you were going in a direction we never understood. That's really interesting. I I, yeah. I love that actually, because I didn't have that sort of ability at 20 to figure that I was doing something that I didn't need to be doing. I've often spoken about how while college was the greatest four years of my life, I had so much fun. I met so many amazing human beings that I'm still friends with today. I don't think anything out of that experience has like taught me anything about life other than how to waste a hundred thousand dollars. Right. So I think, um, for me, like the whole life change came much later after years and years of chasing money, chasing material items that like really just didn't really do much for me. Um, and I'm wildly impressed by people who in their early twenties are able to sort of like look internally and be able to be like, yeah, I'm, this is not for me. I need to find my path and make like strategic alterations to my life. And, that's super impressive to me. Um, so I'm, you graduate college from NYU. You've been working on documentaries and yeah. films. And where's, I mean, there's a, a couple years between then and now, like two or three of them. Yeah. And, and yeah, what's, <laughs> <laughs> what sort of happens when you graduate? And then where does your life go from there? Yeah. So and also in your, in your conversation about switching in your 30s, I don't think it's ever too late to switch. And I, I anticipate another one. I think when I retire, I'm going to go back to medicine. Wow. I have a feeling like I really want to be a 911 dispatcher. I, I just feel I like, think you watch that show on, on Fox and you're just like never. too into it. Yeah, pretty much. Like most moms that are alone a lot at night, we watch a lot of true crime. Yeah. And I feel like I would make a really bang in 911 dispatcher because I, I, I know what it's like to be on the other side of, as a responder. And I just feel like I could... Producing for film and TV is not very dissimilar from being a 911 dispatcher. So we handle a lot of emergencies and put out a lot of fires. (laughs) So I I don't know if this is my career forever. I think when I'm retired, I'm going to do something in medicine. I'm going to be like a hospice volunteer. That's really beautiful. I I like that. I mean, it would be a very nice bow on the Jacqueline Paris life for that full circle moment to come back. It'll make. So what was your what was your major in? I majored in economics and finance. Um, so you may retire in finance. See, the, the, it's no going to go chance. full circle for you, John. <laughs> I may I may retire poor and alone under a bridge somewhere, but I will never get back into finance and no shot. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny because I've been in sales my entire life from my first job out of college to when I got laid off during the pandemic. And the only thing that ever appealed to me about it was the money and the stuff that the money could buy. And I, I've spoken about this at length many times about how I was always searching for something to like fill me on a level that my career wasn't. And it wasn't until all of that was stripped away and I was able to, you know, with the benefit of therapy, figure out who I was and what I wanted out of life. And that's where photography came to me. And it's been like the single greatest blessing in my entire life. I'm so immensely lucky and happy that I've been able to sort of figure that out. And like you said, it doesn't matter. It could have happened at 45. It could happen at 55. Um, I just think we as human beings spend a significant portion of our time worrying about 
the wreckage of the future and what will happen versus like trying to be present and cognitive of what we want out of our life. And that's what I was guilty of for, for a lot of years. Yeah, absolutely. You, I mean, it's, it's, you're like you said, lucky it happened at all. Yeah. It doesn't matter what decade. Yeah. It's funny because when my parents sold their house, um, we were going through like all our bins and boxes and I found all of these like disposable camera pictures that I took like when we were at like sixth grade camp like fucking trip to the UN and I took so many photos and I said to my mom when I like literally quit like got fired from my job and then like became a photographer I was like why didn't everyone ever be like hey John you know you used to really like taking pictures as a kid like it just never occurred to someone to be like this is what you should be doing and it's funny because like it's just like you know full circle Right. But it's true, too, of our guidance counselors. They weren't going to be like, artist, let's find a placement for you. Yeah, no. <laughs> they're, very, no. they're very much looking for check boxes. And 100%. I think a lot of times the arts are a, a place that lives outside of check boxes. So for sure. For yeah. sure. So you graduate, you're working yeah. in film and, and documentary films and yep. TV and producing yep. and what were you doing? What happened? Yeah. So I was working on a couple of different documentaries. Um, they all did really well. We sold a bunch of them. I can talk in detail about them if you're interested. But this was back in 2007, 8, 9. Mm -hmm. And I graduated in 2008. And um, I worked at the same with the same team till about 2009, 10, maybe. And one of our films wrapped and the director of it um, was going on to which is a, this is an interesting concept that that a lot of people don't really notice or recognize but she was finished with a feature-length documentary her debut directorial debut and she had some downtime in between this and her next project so she decided to pick up some commercial work mm -hmm. and direct some commercials and that's one of the I think big hallmark benefits of commercial work is you can pick it up in between larger larger chunks of, of passion projects and art films and make bank and then return to what you're passionate about. Yeah. So she wanted to do commercials and she said, have you ever done producing for commercials? And I said, no. She's like, well, what are you doing next? What's your next film? And I said, I'm not, I'm not sure yet. I think I'm going to take a breath and I'm not sure what I'm doing next. And she's like, well, you should produce commercials with me. And I was like, oh, I'll give it a try. I don't really know anything about it. I had no idea the learning curve, I had no idea how different documentary features versus New York City commercial advertising would be. Yeah. And I said, sure. And I was hired to be a freelance host producer for commercials in New York City. And I ended up at a shop called Lost Planet, which is owned by Hank Corwin, okay. who's um, an Oscar nominated, like three time Oscar nominated editor. Mm -hmm. um, and he has a team of incredible editors that he works with. And I ended up at, at Lost Planet in Soho. And I started doing commercial work and I have really never fully returned to features ever since. Really? Why do you think yeah. that is? Numerous reasons. One is um, I can work on multiple projects at once okay. and I can finish them, start them, finish them and see them delivered in a very short timeline. Mm -hmm. When I was working in documentary features specifically, you have these very large timelines. When you're in development, just coming up with the concept and the funding and coming up with your subject matter and figuring out how you're going to structure it that's a long time of pre-pro usually and then you have this very sometimes very drawn out production process i mean one of the films that i worked on the director had been photo had been shooting this film over 20 years following mm -hmm. the same subject so these timelines can be dramatically yeah. varied right and they can take months and months to edit and a lot of times the editors are working at rates that don't necessarily enable them to focus entirely on it. Mm -hmm. So they have to maybe fit it in in other ways while they're doing other things and taking other projects or it's months because it's hours and hours of footage that they're pouring over to try to find these moments. So documentary timelines can be really mag, you know, the magnitude can be months and months, years and years. Commercials, it's really satisfying because you go from pre-pro to delivery usually in a rapid fire and you learn a lot. It's a great boot camp. It's a great education in watching the whole process unfold and then getting another opportunity to do it again, but do it differently mm -hmm. right away. So I can make a mistake, learn from my mistake and then see myself change within the month. That's cool. And, and also work with numerous different directors, numerous different production companies. Every team is different. I'm not assembling the same team over and over again. So I met tons more people. Whereas in documentaries, you could be with your crew, with your team for months. I was able to meet a new team, a new team, another team, another team. My network grew much faster. Mm -hmm. And when you're young and you're getting your feet on the ground, learning quickly, having lots of things ship quickly, meeting lots of people quickly and making a better rate. 
I mean, it's really hard to not see why commercials can be a great place to start in your career, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But it's also incredibly breakneck and the stress and pace is really intense. So you have to be, you cannot, it's not for the faint of heart. Yeah. So you were in New York for what, like 10 years? Yeah. So I I left in 2011 Mm -hmm. and And I moved to LA. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't know that. Very cool. And how long were you in LA for? Five years. So I was offered by Lost Planet a staff opportunity if I would consider leaving New York and move to LA for to head their LA office um, as a senior producer. And that was a staff opportunity. It was a promotion. It was a new opportunity. And I lived in New Jersey, New York area my whole life, you know. So this was an opportunity to spread my wings, meet new people, live in a city I'd never lived in before, go out on my own a little bit, move far away from home and give it a whirl. So yeah. I did. So I moved to LA for that job opportunity. And you hated it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious because, so I've got a love-hate relationship with LA. I think <clears throat> the people are the <laughs> the most wonderful human beings on earth who love themselves extraordinarily, extraordinarily, and without any really sort of uh, care in the world of any other human being or in their orbit. Um, but the weather's nice. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to be around so many people who care so deeply? Yes, I would. I, I strive for that on on my daily basis. Uh, yeah. But yeah, no, um, I'm super wondering like how much you loved or hated your time out there. I mean, not not I, even necessarily from like a working perspective because it was a huge opportunity for right. you and almost something right. that you can't say no to. But right. And I lived at the office. I mean, I worked a ton those years. I would say those are my workaholic years. Yeah. Where I was just tethered and I didn't really have vacation days and I just was at the studio 24 seven. It became my social life. Mm -hmm. So work-life balance, definitely none when I was out in LA or very little. Um, I was also um, learning how to navigate a relationship because I I was dating uh, a guy in New York and we lived together in New York and then we moved together to LA. Oh, wow. So it was, he had also a job opportunity. Well, well, he was offered a transfer opportunity because he's like, my girlfriend's getting the job in LA and they have a branch in, in LA and he worked in commercial photography. Oh, cool. So he moved um, to industrial color in Los Angeles while I moved to Lost Planet in Los Angeles. And uh, we moved together and we got a house and we started fostering um, rescue dogs. And, you know, it became very domestic. So I was used to New York City where we were on the subway and out till very late and and in a great artist community in Bushwick. And we were in a crazy loft and we were doing all the art scene stuff and going to openings and um, foreign film premieres and just like living a really the New um, York much more and bustle. Art. Yeah. Yeah. And a much more indie and much more arts community focused and fine art to Los Angeles commercial world. Yeah. So, so there's sucker. a lot of culture shock there and also just trying to adjust your relationship to new social circles, new colleagues, and new travel schedules because we both started traveling and he intensively started traveling Mm -hmm. for commercial photography. And so he was never really around very much and his schedule was crazy. So just uh, like LA was a pressure cooker in a a great way, really advanced my career and I'm really glad I went. And I'm glad I know LA. When I talk about producing, it's really great to know cities and say, yes, I know Atlanta in and out. I know the production scene in Atlanta. I know the production scene in New York. I know it's, I know it in LA. So that, that fluency in multiple cities is a huge thumbs up. And I think having a couple big cities in my, on my resume helped me get an executive producer job in Atlanta Mm -hmm. because it's a little bit of a smaller market, obviously. And it's a little bit of a smaller pond and having a little bit of a bigger, a couple bigger ponds, I think made me more attractive to Atlanta. That's interesting. Um, yeah. Talk to me about like external pressures outside of your job because like mm-hmm. it's a big move with a significant mm-hmm. other cross country. Yeah. Like and like I, I'm assuming that didn't stay together for the entirety of yeah right. So I'm like, how did that all like work life balance yeah. sort of unfurl and what did you learn from that? Yeah. So I never found work life balance at Lost Planet while there. I was not ready to face the the challenges and the um fallout of what my what I was doing to myself mm-hmm. when I lived in LA. I wasn't I wasn't ready. I think that that takes time and perspective and I didn't have it yet. But what I did what I was aware of was that I was being victimized in some ways by ageism and sexism. Wow. And 
I won't place that in any particular place, but just to say the industry at that time at, at large, the industry, and I think we all know that now. Oh yeah, there's the like movement, one or two things that may have yeah, come out of the there. News. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's for me, I feel like the biggest thing was ageism and sexism. Mm -hmm. I think because I was young, very young and a woman, I was not treated the same as my male colleagues. I will for put it sure. that way. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of really sexual jokes in the workplace and just a free for all. And that's true of film and TV in a lot of ways. It's very casual. People are wearing whatever they want to wear. They're doing whatever they want to do. They can identify in a way they want to identify. That's what makes it feel so inclusive. And also there's so much camaraderie when you're in the trenches with someone, when you're in the foxholes with these, with this crew, you become this incredible brotherhood, sisterhood amongst the crew and amongst the, the teams that you're working on. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I had a lot of very blatant, very blatant in writing, in email threads. I could print them insane ageism and sexism. And I, I see that now as, okay, you are 20 something. You are living in Los Angeles. This is prior to the Me Too movement. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it was culturally acceptable. I was working with men in their 60s, 50s um, with a lot of power and a lot of control. And no doubt that is what was going on in, in early before 2000. I would say between 2009 and 2013. Yeah. Yeah. That's not fun. No, no. But it makes you stronger. I definitely think it's it's not you can you can choose what to do with that experience. And yeah. I chose to like be galvanized by it. Well, I think that's sort of like a testament to who you are as a human being. I mean, obviously, but that doesn't really surprise me about you at all. I mean, that is Jackie Paris, student body president to its core, right? That's who you are. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm sorry to deal with that. That's just men are just fucking such trash in the <laughs> world. And uh, it's just, yeah, that sucks. Um, and I don't, and I don't, I don't think that way. Just saying, so you know, I, I think do, that I, way. I, yeah, I, I think I speak for ninety five percent of people when I say men are trash. We're just yeah, a disgusting well, bunch. Period. End of story. We don't have to. <laughs> that's evolutionarily significant. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's the internet's fault. But yeah, I, yeah. I, I digress. Um, so you had this huge opportunity in L.A., and then yeah. you get another huge opportunity to move to Atlanta, executive producer with. Uh, yeah. A, 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 I'm sorry. I don't know who you work for. Yeah, uh, Deluxe Entertainment Services. They are uh, over a hundred year old company. They own. Of, uh, they did at the time own a bunch of other companies like Encore, Method, Company Three, oh, cool, cool. Um, East Editorial, and they. Um, I didn't move for the opportunity to Atlanta. Uh, my um, I, husband at the time, he his family lives in Atlanta. My children's father's family lives in Atlanta, and he saw an incredible opportunity in Atlanta with the tax incentives and the incredible amount of production happening in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And we thought, you know, LA is just not the place that we really were ready to raise children and yeah. buy a house and live well in LA. <laughs> yeah. And so in, in becoming married and deciding we want to start a family, it just made a lot of sense to move back to where cost of living is better. The pace felt better. We were close to his parents, mm -hmm. um, close to his family all around. So we decided to move to Atlanta. He had a lot of opportunities there and I did not have any opportunities that I knew of concretely in Atlanta. Um, so we moved to Atlanta basically with the idea that I'd find something when I got there. Wow. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. But you're married at that time. You know, you feel it's, it feels different. You're a team. Yeah. There's partnership in that. Um, you're not flying solo. So when one person has a great opportunity, you know, he moved for it to LA for me in a way mm -hmm. because I was the catalyst to move out there and he believed and I believed in the move to Atlanta. That's nice. I yeah. can't I can't relate to that in any way. I've never had a partnership that spanned any more cities than one at a time. Um yeah. I'm I'm curious like how your personal life and your work life sort of evolved because like being a mom juggling motherhood yeah. and children and I've got five nieces and nephews. I've got a lot of like, Hey, this is so fun. Now you can put them and to bed you're done. and I'm yeah. done. Um, yep. But uh, like I, I do not envy the work life balance for parents at all because th especially in the last two years, there is none um, right. that has evaporated. Um, but talk to me about like being new in LA, uh, LA, Atlanta, and then like yeah. that process of like being a mom, working, finding opportunities in your career. Like that's got to be a lot. Oh yeah. So I had a really, um, a really bumpy road. Uh, so I landed in Atlanta, 
and I start chatting with a bunch of shops in Atlanta, but I don't end up getting a ton of Atlanta based work as a freelancer because I'm mm -hmm. also new to the market. And I think Atlanta, rightfully so, is really sensitive about people coming in from LA and New York as opportunists mm -hmm. when there was a lot of there was a lot of incredible homegrown talent here. So that have been here for decades. And then we come in like seagulls and say, like, we're here, we're gonna shit all over everything. Mine. And um, yeah. So I think that there is a lot of, you know, looking for a 404 area code phone number when you're talking about getting a gig. And I think that it was more, you know, priority to the ones that had been here tried and true. And I get that. Um, and I and I believe in that. So so I had no problem with it, but I ended up traveling a lot to LA and New York for work. Mm -hmm. So even though I lived in Atlanta, I've worked in LA and New York pretty right. much until I got a staff job at Deluxe. Um, and I was shopping for a house. So I was doing a lot of open houses and real, looking at real estate, studying the market, looking at floor plans of homes and looking at neighborhoods and trying to figure out where's, I never really spent any significant time in Atlanta. I didn't know the city, didn't know the neighborhoods, didn't know where do we want to be? Where, what's a good, what's a good spot? So I was doing a lot of that while Brett traveled and Brett was working on a documentary for the BBC about Olympic athletes. Cool. So he was interviewing Olympic athletes. I think he took 72 flights that year. Oh my God. Um, yeah. So he was like a so like a diamond platinum medallion sky mile. <laughs> I don't know. He was yeah. like, yeah. he was doing well yeah. <laughs> in the sky mile department, yeah. but I was at back at home, like pounding the pavement. We did that for a little while. And then I ended up pregnant with our first son and got an interview for this great opportunity as an executive producer while I'd been like one week, found out I was pregnant one week. And I was thinking, you know, legally, we don't have to disclose our status of pregnant or not during an interview, obviously. Sure. But I also felt if this was a employee-employer relationship that was going to be built on mutual trust and that I was going to do well with and I was going to jive well with and and appreciate their ethos, then I could say it and see how they responded. And if they there was no, you know, discrimination or concern about it and there was a lot of support around it, that would probably be a place that would support motherhood and all of its complexities, including my schedule and maybe a lactation space or maybe a maternity leave or maybe, you know, so I really hemmed and hawed over whether to say anything. I hadn't even told my parents. I hadn't told anybody that I was pregnant um, except for my partner, Brett. And I was in this interview and I thought, this is really going to affect this job because if I do go on maternity leave, I could count out how many months it would be before I'm gone. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, oh, gosh, it's a lot of, you know, it could be a lot of travel. It's a lot of sales missions. It's a lot of hours in the studio. It's very stressful. Like it's a, it's an incredible opportunity. It's a leadership role, but gosh, like I, I don't know what motherhood's going to look like either. And the, a uh, man interviewing me was is a father himself. And I was just like, I'm just going to tell him. And if he doesn't hire me because Fuck of it, him. that's that's good information. So I tell him and his response was so reassuring and supportive. He was like, wow, you didn't really, you know, I said, I know I don't legally have to tell you this, but I do want to warn you. I am pregnant. It's very early on. But if I do have this child, it will be nine months from now. I will want a maternity leave. Mm -hmm. And if that's a deal breaker for you, let's talk about it. Yeah. And let's talk about it now. Um, and now I probably would have approached that differently. <laughs> now having been a leader of a studio, I would probably have approached that differently. But at the time, I really was not aware of boundaries, personal boundaries, setting expectations of saying, these are my needs, not is it okay if I have a need? Hmm. You know? So now I'm a lot more forward about my needs. I'm very curious because that is uh, an extremely sort of pragmatic approach towards like life and like that, like the the, the line between personal and professional. Um, and I would, I would assume that the majority of people would not have chosen to do the path that you would have, they would have got the job and then four or five weeks later, they've been like, Oh, yeah. I'm pregnant. Um, yeah. but you looked at it like very pragmatically. What do you think about like you specifically or the way that your, um, mental processing works that you looked at things like in it, like uh, the way you explained it makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. If this is a person who's not yeah. going to respect this boundary. I don't want to work here. Right. But that's not a normal thought process. Most people we are be like, interviewing people when we are being interviewed. Yeah. We are deciding whether that's a work culture, whether the, they have the advocacy, the diversity, the inclusivity, the equity, whether they have a sustainability plan, whether they have been paternal paid you know paternity leave or or support if you want to take a paternity leave, um, whether or not they recognize your spouse of the same gender on health benefits in mm. your family plan. Like you are, you are 
looking at the culture of an institution before you decide that you're going to put that signature at the bottom of your email. And I think that's something that we are just now beginning to understand. And I, and I think that even so much as seven years ago when I did this interview, I wasn't there yet. But I, I think that I'm looking for information. I'm looking for information when I'm being interviewed. And I'm thinking, would this be a spot I could thrive? Would this be a spot I could grow? Who am I going to learn from? Who are my mentors? Are they good people? Are they sound people to learn from? Are they making industry choices that lead us to believe they have a great reputation? So none of what you just said surprises me at all because that is like who I know Jackie, Jacqueline Paris to be, right? Like that's not shocking at all. But I, mm-hmm. I often hem and haw about the, like, could 25-year-old John have learned lessons that 35-year-old John has, like, implemented into his life? And I don't think I can. But you strike me as a person that has and would yeah. have. Um, and, like, that that pragmatic, very uh, linear approach to life, I'm sure, has served you well. Oh, and definitely. I'm very curious if you took that job. Yes, I did. So, and it, it, it it's interesting because... The information I, I gleaned from that interview ended up almost being in a soothsayer moment. It came true. So I um, I took the job. I loved the job. I, I was like really – I always wanted to be an executive producer and have that opportunity. So I felt like, okay, this was the resume topper. This was the title I've always wanted to have. And because motherhood's coming down the pipe really soon, I'm glad I have it before I became a mom. Mm-hmm. If I ended up taking time off and going back to my industry, I wanted to go back to my industry having had this experience under my belt. Yeah. So I was really proud of the job. I loved the colleagues that I had. I did the job. I had a child and I took my maternity leave and I came back and things fell apart for me. So my son was a, a traumatic birthing experience, a NICU baby. Um, multiple significant health issues, uh, in and out of medical care for the first 18 months of his life, never slept through the night till he turned 18 months old, um, ear surgery at nine months old. Like we, we had our, we had a run Yeah. and I just continued to push. I was the EP of all EPs. I was the mom of all moms trying to juggle both spinning plates all the time. And things were just crashing all around me, but I was like, I'm just going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep doing it and face every challenge. And it was my mother who I called to please come in. She's retired at this point. I'm like, I need you. I'm going to book her flight for the next morning. She's got to come in because my son has a chest infection again, and we need to do nebulizer treatments every four hours around the clock, including waking him up. How am I going to do that and be an executive producer? So I said, so moms are amazing and they come to your rescue. So my mom came in, but she had a really incredible come to Jesus moment with me where she said, how, what is your plan? It was a stop the train. Let's pause. What is your plan? And I didn't have one. How are you going to get this child to eat solid foods? How are you going to do this when I leave? Because I'm not staying forever. I'll stay for two weeks and help you out. But what's your, how is this sustainable? What is your plan? And I did not have one. And she's like, you can't hire a nurse or a nanny to, to make these, these decisions. This is a parent's choice. You can't make, you can't hire a nanny to nurse, rehabilitate your child back to health. You can't take a nurse or a full-time nanny and say, you need to go to these doctor's appointments. You need to do these breathing treatments. You need to do this medicine. How are you going to do this? And she said, you need to figure this out. And she was right. And nobody else was going to hold up the mirror but your mother. What was that feeling like for you? Like when that, that realization struck that like maybe what you were doing and, and that balance between work and life I, wasn't working. Yeah, it was really bad. It felt terrible. But she was totally right. I needed mm-hmm. that moment. And that was in December. That was around Christmas break. It was before Christmas break. And I just had a meeting with the same guy who interviewed me. And it's been like, you know, at that point, it's been like two years since that interview day. And here it is. And I said, I can't do this anymore. So I need to take time off and spend it with my son. And he offered me FMLA, family medical leave of absence. And he said, how about four weeks or how about six weeks? He was trying to figure out how much time do you need? And I realized, I thought about it. I think I took the day, you know, I was like, let me get back to you. And I thought, no, there's no timeline for this. I do not know. I do not know how long it will take. And I refuse to put that pressure on myself to put a deadline on my son's health. I know it could take eight weeks or it could take eight months. I, 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 I have no real sense. And if I say, oh, I'll be back in four weeks, you know what I'm going to do, John. I'm going to be back in four weeks. Yeah. Regardless of what's mm-hmm. happening, I'm going to force the shoe to fit the foot. And I'm going to say, I'll be back in four weeks. Mm-hmm. So I just said, I can't give you a timeline. And I know you can't hold this job position. Let's open, ended indefinitely. We need someone here to be the executive producer. So I quit. 
and I gave like a month's notice and I just said, you know, mid, mid January, I'm out. And that's what I did. I quit my job Wow. and I was a stay at home mom for three years. <laughs> it took three years. That's what you do for your children. Sometimes if you have the socioeconomic ability, the well, freedom to do so, which a lot of people don't. I was, I'm very glad you said that because I, I didn't mm -hmm. want to dive too deep yep. into like your financials because those types of decisions often come from a place of financial strength, um, yep. which I would imagine, obviously, socioeconomically, you had done well for yourself and it, it provided you with that opportunity to make that decision. Um, do you think had you not had that buffer, that uh, sort of space for yourself, that it would have been hard for you to make that decision to leave? No, and it's oh. in a weird way because I have said this before, um, now that I'm divorced and I'm a single mom, but this is, this is, this is all happening while married. So I have someone else with health insurance. Okay. I have someone else covering the family. I have someone else earning a, an income we could, we could estimate and say, it's going to be about this and mm -hmm. it's pretty reliable. So I made that decision in partnership, not solo. Right. But since flying solo, I have had very, um, th these questions asked of me, like, how are you doing financially? Like, how do you, how are you, how's life? And I have said, very very seriously like i will live in a tent for my children like i don't care what it takes i would sell my house i would sell all my physical possessions i'd move into my parents basement i would literally do whatever it takes and it, the truth is is that i didn't have a choice whether to quit my job or not i had to quit my job mm -hmm. so whether that meant like incredible cutbacks or um find humbling yourself enough to take support from family members and saying yes i'm drowning and i need help i need someone to throw a life preserver i would have done it and I'm fortunate that I didn't have to, but I didn't feel, I felt my hands were tied on this decision. And that w when you have a chronically ill child, like life just absolutely stops. You can't function. You cannot function when like they're going like with- Well, with there's my, one priority. Yeah. There's just yeah, one. You, you literally can't, it's, it's just survival and Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you don't have like the foundation you can't build on top of it. You cannot be self-actualized. You cannot focus on other things when you have like the foundational parts of the, that Maslow's triangle, triangle crumbling. Mm -hmm. So that's what it felt like to me at that time period. Yeah, I mean, that's heavy. Uh, you have two kids and two sons now, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and when you have a chronically ill child and then you bring another kid into the world, um, is that like chaotic and, and mm -hmm. is it incredible and... and in chaotic and incredible and chaotic. I mean, like well, I did it on purpose. I was like, I'm forced into this extended maternity leave. That's what I called it. I was yeah. like, because of my son's problems, I'm I'm forced into this leave of absence from my work, mm -hmm. which I struggled with because I could not relate to stay at home moms because I didn't know any Atlanta stay at home moms because I didn't know what do you do with a toddler all day. I didn't have the I was not a early childhood education kind of gal. Mm -hmm. I had not done a ton of babysitting. I had not changed diapers until I had a child. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have this wealth of experience to draw from. And I'm not like a nursery rhyme kind of chick. You know, there's like a little bit of darkness. It was it's a very challenging transition for me to become a stay at home mom. And I thought to myself, I'm forced into this um, phase of my life. And what can I do to maximize its prag again, pragmatic efficiency is I'm going to have my second child right now. I'm home anyway. Yeah. I'm, I'm taking a pause from my career, from building my career portfolio. I'm taking that pause anyway. If I do ever want to have a second child, let's do it right now while I'm home anyway. Was so any, I did. Sorry to interrupt you. Was any yeah. um, part of that timeline because I don't know the the sort of the 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 fre reference frame in terms of like when the when you were divorced and like how that process unfolded. Um, did any part of that having a second child feel like sort of a band aid on a on a on a wound of a relationship? Because I would imagine the eighteen months, two years of going through all of that chaos with the, the childhood uh, with your child who had all those needs was stressful on a relationship. Um, did any part of that sort of play into the thought process of having another child? Well, I, I really felt strongly that I wanted a second child okay. and I felt like this would be a great time to do it. Mm -hmm. My, um, my children's father did not feel strongly as much about having children in the first place, let alone having a second one. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think he was very committed to the idea of growing a family. And so 
I don't think, I think things were actually really good with us at that time period, because I think it can go one of two ways. You can see that really fracture relationship, the stress, the added stress of an ill child and disagreeing about things and medical treatment and just the the exhaustion, just the sheer sleep deprivation can do incredible things to your marriage. Mm -hmm. But I think actually we were very much working as a well-oiled machine at that point that we were dividing and conquering. Like you do this, I do this, you know, we were, we were just all about him. We were all about the kiddo. So I think it, bonded us over a common cause and then i had my second child um and they're less than two years apart so my oldest was two was one when i brought home my second so i had the 202 it's a lot (laughs) if you're gonna do it just like shove it all in (laughs) or out (laughs) yeah Mm -hmm. um yeah so then it was like nursery i was daycare i was um I built a nursery school in my house and yeah. had two kiddos. But thankfully, they were your own, and you didn't have to worry about any other rascals, right? <laughs> and I didn't have to carry an incredible uh, liability umbrella. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I, I recently wrote uh, – so I've got a blog, and I recently wrote a post about like failure and how we as people, whether it is a, a social media-based uh, phenomenon or – just like the ego of humans to not be able to admit their failures and or be able to articulate like when we're struggling as human beings, like you had the ability to have your mother come down when you were clearly going through some shit and you needed help and that coming to Jesus moment, how it served you. Um, When you, I hate to use the term failure when it comes to marriage, but like in essence, when you're shedding sort of a part of your Mm -hmm. life that everyone, you know, you need to check boxes and get married and white pick a fence. When, when these sort of things occur, how did you deal with them? So that's a great question. So, well, I know you and I align on this. I'm a huge proponent of going to therapy. Yeah. I mean, for starters, I think that's a great starting point. Um, But I am not afraid to try things for fear of failing. So I'm not, I have no regrets I, in life. I very, very much so do not live with regrets. I absolutely realize there are areas I could have done things differently in, in, in learning and growing. And I try to take those things with me, but I'm not a very regretful person. Mm-hmm. I don't hold regrets for things. And um, I did a lot of work. I decided that if I was going to have a marriage, I was going to work on it and not be afraid of doing the work. So that includes marriage counseling and showing up for the relationship and trying to prioritize it and trying to figure out, well, is this what we need or is that what we need? So I was very proactive, I feel, in those areas. And um, you can't do that alone. And it, I, at some point, I was I was still on the counseling couch, still willing to put in the work, still willing to show up for everything. And my uh, partner at the time decided he was done. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have to make the decision. It was made for me in a, in a way. And that helps a lot for me because it takes control out of my court. Well, <laughs> you strike me as a extraordinarily type A person. Um, in that moment where I'll take that as a compliment. No, it is a compliment. It's <laughs> not, it's not, I'm not making fun of you. Um, <laughs> no, but, uh, like you said, you're like willing to put in the effort. Like this is something that you're willing to fight for. What does that do to like your emotional state and like your, like your just your your soul when like your partner or the person that you've been with for X number of years is like I I don't want this anymore. Like I, I yeah I've been told no, uh, believe it or not, a, a few million times, and I I don't get tired of it. Like I like being told that I'm not your person. I don't mind that anymore. But like 25 year old John would sit in a bar and fucking get shit faced yeah. and cry. Yep. Um, but what did that feel like? Um, well, you know, to be really honest with you, I think at the risk of sounding like I've used my children as human shields, Mm -hmm. I think there's a part of you that just, I remember when you told me that it was very definitive. I I tell you what day it was. I know exactly where we were. I know what time it was when he told me we were done and I had a zoom meeting for work in like 30 minutes. So it was a very like, pull up, you know, pull yourself back up, wipe your face, you're on camera, you're on a Zoom call for work. Mm -hmm. And I just move forward. And I think part of it's just survival. Like I have two kids that I have to show up every morning for. They wake up at 630. I have to feed them. I'm a full time 100% custody of my kids. So I'm I'm 100% on camera for them every minute of the day. Mm -hmm. And when you're in survival mode, you don't have time to sit and cry about it or sit and mourn. And I just launch into pragmatism and into function and into survivorship. And I just really, really cranked it out. I was like, all right, 
we're going to get the house. We're going to do the things. We're going to figure out, we're going to make the kids not know about this. We're going to shelter them from this. We're going to figure out how to be peaceful co-parents. We're going to be great co-parents. We're just going to keep going, keep going. And it was only when the ink dried on the divorce decree and I had it in my hands, which was months and months later, because that takes time Mm -hmm. to deal with all that crap. It was only when I held it in my hands that I was like, wow, the survivor, um, mentality adrenaline dropped and it was gone and it was like this is done like it's very finalized and i had in my hands and i that was the first time i felt any ounce of grief about and they talk about divorce as as uh, the the steps of grief you mourn the relationship it is literally dead the relationship Mm -hmm. is gone and you have to mourn it like anything else and i held that thing and that was when for the very first time i was sad Mm -hmm. it was only almost a year later wow yeah Actually, it was 13 months later. That's very interesting. I mean, again, it's you don't have a choice to sort of react in any other manner. You're a full-time mom. You're full-time working. You're, you have no choice but to be yeah. that. Um, that feels the like... Helps. The helps. Honestly, being purposeful. I'm not saying this is a good coping mechanism. I'm not saying distract yourself into oblivion. <laughs> make yourself so purposeful. You can't feel feelings. Yeah. But there, you know, there are jokes. I have a lot of jokes with my friends. I have been called the tin woman. Oh. A lot of people don't feel like I have a full range of emotions available to me. <laughs> so I, I just didn't get besotted with grief. I didn't, I did not. And again, failure is part of our, our, our world, right? And in the arts community, you're going to face a ton of rejection. You have to keep putting your portfolio. You have to keep sending self-addressed stamped envelopes, not literally anymore, but you know what I mean? <laughs> you have to keep yeah. sending out the queries and the manuscripts. You have to keep reaching. And if you are afraid of being told no and having doors shut in your face, it's hard to be an artist. Mm-hmm. So you you know what it's like to face failure and say, it's okay, I got to keep doing it anyway. 100%. But I think... I come from this in a place where I have zero dependence and I have the ability to absorb every single no. I also have the utmost belief in myself and my skills and my path. Like I've already manifested where I'm going to be a year from now because two years ago I've manifested where I am today. And it's like, there's no doubt. I know I'm going to be successful. It's not a matter of if it's just when it happens. It's like everything that I've built over the course of two years has led me to this point. Um, but it's very easy for people to take that rejection and that failure and internalize it and be like, I'm a loser. I'm a failure. I can never do anything else. And I, that's why I wrote the blog post. I, I, I wish there was a, the ability for people to normalize failure. It's the most common thing in life, but we don't talk about it. We have to eschew right. it because you can't be vulnerable on the internet. Can't be vulnerable about who we are as right. people. And we experience these things every single day. And it can be very, um, uh, uh it could have a paralytic effect if you cannot, face failure because then you can't move i think the thing is is that your own inner voice as an artist and as as a maker is stronger than that of your audience so you are more invested in what you think of your work than what everyone else is saying so i think that's a huge benefit to your trajectory because that's really what you're saying when you manifest things is that you you have heard yourself you are listening to your own voice you are listening to your inner gut you are listening to your intuition your instincts are driving you not what the guidebook says, not what that agent that rejected you five years ago told you your path would look like, not what, you know, what the critics say. It's really about you. I want to tell you a funny story. It's, I'll make it quick because I, two years ago, put my portfolio together and it was shit. And <clears throat> I found this woman on Twitter who's like a, um, I don't want, okay. She's this person whose like opinion mattered greatly. And she was like, Hey, I'm doing free portfolio reviews and I want to look through anyone who sends me an email. I will look through your work. So I sent her my portfolio and I, it's still sitting in my inbox because I refuse to delete it. And it is something to the extent of, Hey, your work is not important and nothing about what you sent me is something that I need to review. So I don't want to waste your time and review it. And I was just like, cool, I'm super glad that you feel that way. I will be talking to you in a few years. And I basically was like, S my D and yeah. But those sort of motivations are crucially important because being told no should push you into being something better than you are currently. Because it's not a no, right? You're not saying no to me. You're just saying no to what my happenstance is today. 
Tomorrow right. is a different story. The work that I produce between that moment and today has propelled me to where she's probably going to interact with me at some point in the future and hire me. It's like you have to be able to take these instances of loss and regret and failure and have them be self-motivational tools to grow. Mm-hmm. And um, you need to be able to reject people with grace. Ooh. Because if you're a producer, you do end up having to reject people. And so I'm going to empathize with her position, but I'm not going to validate the way she <laughs> talked to you because you, the community is small and incestuous yeah. and it's incredible how many times you circle back to the same people. And it is, it is likely that your elbows may bump into each other at an art show in the future. And it's, I think she should be careful how she rejects people. I just hope she thinks I'm cute and I can be like, mm, no, sorry, girl. Not doing yeah, it. You've been working that angle for a little too long. Yeah. I've, I've been thinking, I think about it. It's the thing that motivates me though, because if, if someone tells me I'm not good enough, I have now put them on a pedestal of someone I need to prove wrong. And it might not be the most healthy manner in which to go about something. But as a creative, I found the biggest thing that I lack is, uh, motivation outside of just creation, right? So I need something beyond the motivation to create. And that sort of, I don't know if I can use the word traumatic, but that sort of rejection fuels me to want to be a success above where she thought I was. So it's I don't need motivation to create, but I do need motivation to shoot with XYZ, bill xyz right. like the money management the uh, you right. know the the business side of of growth that I, I at times need because i'm very very happy with just creating work and if you I, are on left side of your brain right side of your brain and le- one side is the maker and one side's the manager i think that it's very much healthier the the dynamic you have where you are you are you don't need inspiration to to shoot Mm -mm. that's huge because there's this great quote from baldessari who said like um great artists are possessed which you cannot will you cannot will yourself to be possessed by your art but you can will yourself with willpower to say all right gotta open my quickbooks (laughs) gotta be disciplined but the true possession the true possessed nature that photography has over you, you can't will that. That's something beyond will, yeah, in my no. opinion. And it's, I say it very often, but like there are moments when I'm on set or I'm, on, I'm doing a shoot when I capture an image and if it's, obviously it's not if I'm shooting film, but like when I shoot a digital and I look at the back and it's there, that feeling is an indescribable moment where I know I'm doing the thing that I'm meant to do and it's an immensely freeing and wonderful sort of feeling. Um, you're in a creative industry, I'm going to say business side or like management side. Do you mm-hmm. have any creative pursuits in yourself outside of work? Mm-hmm. I wish I had a funny answer for this and had something that was like very, very off putting and, and <laughs> odd and underground that I could say I do like, but I, I don't, but I, I have a bunch of artistic pursuits. So one of the things that I really like is I do like design. So I do tend to do a bunch of home renovation projects in my mm-hmm. own home. Nice. Um, and I, I'm also writing a zine right now. So um, that's so cool. I, I love zines. Writing or drawing? I, Are you doing both? Writing. Okay. I'm writing. Um, and I'm teaming up with a female illustrator. Awesome. It's, it's really about divorce. It's about motherhood and dating and being being a single mom. How? Sorry to interrupt you. How, how, that's okay. I'm, I'm so I, I used to do a lot of internet writing about dating and relationships um, way back in the day. Um, how is dating as a single mom? Is it impossible? Is it? No. Well, so I had a date with a guy who gave me great perspective because he he called me on a couple things that I'm really grateful. I went on some dates with this guy. He said um, one one great piece of advice he said was, I hate to say this to you, um, but I noticed when you talk about your children a lot, you talk about them as if they're your burdens and not your bonuses. Wow. They'll say like, yeah, so sorry. Like, I can't really do that. You know, I got the kids. Um, sorry about that. Very apologetic or saying, well, I would, you know, but uh, I'm, so, like, I'm sorry. I've got, I got these two kids. Like as if it was a demerit against my against my resume oh. rather than a bonus of an additional skill or additional package that we come as a as a pair, as a as a group, you know, yeah. I would excuse it or dim, or diminish it or try to hide the fact that I had children. Not that I wouldn't disclose it, but it wouldn't be like the first thing I wanted to talk about or I would 
a, a, very apologetic about it and, mm-hmm. and maybe a little bashful that I had children, that somehow it made me broken or made me a less qualified candidate to date because now I have these two little kids. Wow. And at the time they were, you know, they're, I think they were, when we got divorced, like when we separated, they were three and five. So they're little. It's not like I am saying, oh, they flew the nest and I'm an empty yeah. nester and look, I'm so available. Like they're very much a part of my every single day. And a lot of dudes also were turned off by the fact that I had them every day. Mm-hmm. Um, they could handle, oh, 50-50 custody. There will be 50% of the time where I will get this chick alone. Right. But the idea that, no, 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 they live with me. No, 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 they sleep in my house every night. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I think that <laughs> was a turn off for a lot of people. So I ended up becoming an excuser. Like, sorry about this, but I do have two kids. And so this guy was like, listen, and he was a father himself. And he had like, you know, quite a significant amount of age on me. And so as a, as a, imparting some wisdom on the youth, he said, I want to just say you should, you should be so proud. Like you're, that makes you more of an interesting candidate. That makes you more of an interesting person. That's an incredible bonus. They're not a burden. They're a bonus. They're going to help you find the right match because they're going, because a guy who wants that whole package is going to want you. Like you don't have to excuse them. You can be really proud and say, and it's amazing. I have these two kids. Wow. I love yeah, that guy. That's, I know, me too. Jeez. He also said something about my body, which is really interesting. So for all the mamas out there, um, <laughs> dating, <laughs> dating uh, as a single mom and like postpartum, mm-hmm. and uh, like I nursed for an extended period of time. So like you know you're getting back on the market and like you're not that far off from being a pregnant lady. Yeah. Uh, he said something about um, he worked in a motorcycle shop. He was a metal worker, incredible fabrications of custom motorcycles, and he which is very hot, John. I was just going to say, this guy sounds hot. Can I get him on my podcast? Jesus. <laughs> I, he would totally do it too. And he, he read this um, like Zen and the art of motorcycle riding or this, yeah. this, he read a lot of Buddhism books about, but also about craftsmanship and working with your hands. Mm-hmm. Also great. Yeah. And he, and he said, um, I, I also think he perceived that I was not as confident about my body. And he said, you have to uh, make the best use of the tools you have because these are the tools you have. This is it. This is what you have in your tool bag. You open the tool bag. These are the tools you have. You have to accept that this is the bag. That is all the bag will be. These are your tools. Enjoy them. Make good use of them. Like see them for what they are and not be like, I wish I had this tool. I wish I had that tool. Just, just open your bag and look at your tools and then just exploit the shit out of the tools you have. And I was like, yes, yeah. like it's so simple. I mean, it's, well, it's, it's simple for a man to say, simple. cause I, I agree wholeheartedly with what he's saying. Yeah. Very easy for a man to have that perspective. And I have that perspective of a man. I am who I am. I have wonderful dad bod. Uh, you know, I'm like, I'm yeah. unapologetically myself, but yeah. society doesn't give that space for women, especially no. postpartum women, all that stuff. So I, I get mm-hmm. it. I get it. Yeah. It's like, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. This is all that it is. And this is what it is. And you're looking at it, look it in the face and be like, this is what it is. This is the, this is what I've been left with. And just like own it, love it, use it. Yeah. I love that. I yeah. mean, listen, yeah. I, I've made the same joke about seven times via Instagram. You have not aged a fucking day. You look exactly oh, okay. the same as like second grade. It's bewildering. And I am not aging that well. And it's like, what the fuck, dude? Like, drop your skincare routine and, like, share the wealth. I have no skincare routine. <laughs> so no skincare routine here's is my, the new skincare routine. <laughs> Work inside in the basement. Never get any sun on your face. Um, enormous amounts of stress. And caffeine. don't have any time for self-care. Okay. And then you won't notice yeah. that you're actually aging. You'll just be in a little time capsule of formaldehyde in your basement like me <laughs> nice very nice yeah. um i like to spend the last bit of every podcast doing like a little bit of a rapid q a some are super easy some are a little bit more in depth um what is your favorite movie well, that's a really hard question All right, give me but... like two or three then okay favorite narrative feature julian schnabel's diving bell and the butterfly okay and down um read the book first is my well disclaim um fav- like you want a different genre or just yeah. should we leave it there just like that's top- a pretty good okay you're good there top- uh yeah. is it your favorite book as well no what's no. your favorite book oof um by the shore by galaxy craze hmm. i'm not familiar yeah it's actually like a ya book i think Okay, that sounds like because like my skin, I haven't my literary skills haven't also aged since. 
Did you <laughs> last fun. hung out with me? <laughs> yeah, 18 years ago. Um, what's your favorite do food? Do I get to do a rapid fire QA about you as yes. a child? Yes, absolutely. After this? Okay. Yeah. Favorite food? Uh, potato, because I can make it a million different ways. Dude, my cousin, I guess in law, my cousin's wife made such bomb mashed potatoes last night that I'm, I've got them in, I'm looking at my refrigerator and I'm having them for lunch. Yeah. And I also just realized I left my orange juice out for the last three hours. So that's going in the garbage. Great. Um, do you believe it's a kombucha? <laughs> <laughs> Ew, no, I'm not hipster enough for that. Um, do you believe in an afterlife? That's a really hard question. Um, no, I don't think, so. I think we do come back though. I think, I think we have energetic forms that move out into the universal space, but I don't necessarily believe in a heaven or hell. Yeah. I, I, I like that. Um, yeah. this is going to be somewhere in the episode of my nineties and I'm going to go with about 80 plus percent think that there is something when we die. And I'm not talking about like a party in the cloud, but just like, it's not just finite, finite it's over, which I find personally very reassuring. Um, what inspires you? Afterlife? Yeah. Wholeheartedly. Yeah. I don't think like, I'm not a religious person. I don't think like Jesus Christ is going to be like meeting me at some gate somewhere and being like, yo, John, we've been waiting for you, bro. Like come fucking smoke a J. No, <laughs> I think it's just much more. I'm, I'm, I marvel at the beauty of life. And I think that we are put here to spend as much time as possible doing the things that make us happy and fulfilled. Um, but I think just like the sheer audacity that I exist is too improbable for there to not be something beyond this life. And I just think like there is a one in 8 billion, 80, hundred billion chance of being born. And that to me just gives some credence to that. It can't just be <laughs> like an accidental right. happenstance. Um, but yeah, what, uh, what inspires you? Oh, uh, my kids, oh, they nice. provide the ultimate reservoir of great, story ideas, information about the world, uh, self-reflection. I like that. Pain. <laughs> what gives you confidence? Um, well, that's a great question. Um, probably uh, showing up for people like when then nailing it mm -hmm. um, gives me a lot of confidence. I like that. Yeah, like especially when they need it, you know, like the times of need, answering the call. And oh. like nailing it. I like that. Yeah. Um, last question. What is your biggest dream? Oof, that's a really good question. Um, I have a lot of, I have a strong feeling that I can't control a lot of the outcomes of my children's lives. And I think when they're really little, you think you're shaping them into who they're going to be. I actually have felt recently that you can only shape so much and they will be who they are going to be. Mm -hmm. And I can provide a, vessel for their you know experiences but i'm actually not shaping them quite as much so which makes the control of their outcomes off of my out of my hands somewhat mm -hmm. and th then it's up to more happenstance like you're saying the improbability of like how did we end up here so my dream is that my children are both happy healthy that kind of that kind of dream that's beautiful all right hit me with your your rapid okay so um you as a child what was the hardest part about being a twin um, comparisons. Um, my sister was very smart, um, very successful in sports and life. And I really didn't give a fuck about much. I didn't think, I don't think I really found myself until like the, my thirties, like understanding like who I am and what I wanted out of life. And that's nobody's fault except for my own. I found a million ways not to be John. And I think when you're tied to another person based on, you know, genetics and birth time, uh, it's very easy to be, oh, well, Jessica did this. Why did John do that kind of thing? It never affected me because I had great parents, right? And I had a great sister and brother and life was great. Um, but it is hard when you have no other choice other than to be completely constantly compared to another person. Yeah, that's interesting. When you look back on your, like, I would say second to fifth grade or like, early late grandview early gould mm -hmm. would you say that you were happy yeah yeah I'm, i've lived honestly i've been happy my entire life there are small pockets of heartbreak and emotional distress normally when it comes to like relationships or work that felt like cataclysmic horrible 
events that I could never get beyond that obviously I have. Um, but yeah, growing up, I was just a happy fucking kid. I mean, I was just like, what's that? Do you remember bullying anybody? Yeah. Rick Mianuli. Yeah. Me and Rick became weirdly best friends. Like as we got older and we talked about how he was on my podcast. I don't think he listened to it. Um, but we talked about it and we were like, he was like, dude, do you know you used to pick on me every single day in sixth grade? And I was like, no, man, I don't, I don't realize that at all. He was like, yeah, man, every, cause we were on the same bus. And he was like, you're just such an asshole. Like you would just like make fun of me for no reason. And like, you're just a dick. And I was like, dude, honestly, like I want to say, I'm sorry. No, sorry is ever going to like eliminate what I did from 10 to 12. Right. Um, but obviously it's not the person that I am now. And it, it was like, it was, we kind of had like this nice cathartic moment cause he has become like one of like my true best friends. And, uh, yeah, I think you just like go about life in a way at a young age and not understand that your actions have consequences and it's pretty standard, you know, childhood shit. Um, I never like beat anybody up. I think I was just mean with words. And, you know, when I look back on it now, I, I journal a lot about it. Like I have, I think like sort of a, a movie in mind when I eventually like finish it out because man, it's so much worse being a kid now with like constant access to bullying and communication and social media and all that shit. Like I, I, I would be petrified to be a parent just because it's, it's, it's hard. Um, but yeah, I, I do remember being a shithead as a kid. Yeah. Do you remember bullying anybody else? Mm, not really. No. Were you bullied? I don't think so. No. Why do you think I was? No, I just, uh, re- I, no, I was just wondering. Cause I, I remember, I remember you bullying Rick Manuli. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think he was like my sole focus and I don't know why. I yeah. had one. I had a sole focus that I bullied and I got punched for it. Oh shit. Yeah. No way. I don't know if you remember this. I, I don't. Know don't. If you talk about it. There's no apology that I can make at 36 that will ever make up for torment done to a person. It's incredibly impactful and incredibly traumatic for growth to a child to be like picked on and bullied for something that is completely, utterly out of your control and there's nothing you could do about it. And it's can't learn those lessons when you're a kid because you're a fucking kid. You don't know any better. Yep. It's just really hard growing up and it's harder now. And my God, I would just... It, yeah, it's it's scary to be a parent because you don't know what's going on because your kids don't tell you, right? Because it's easier to keep that inside. And it's as an uncle, you know, I'm fearful about that happening to my nieces and nephews, but I would just fucking kill like a 14 year old kid. I would just fucking punt them in the face and, and get rid yeah, of that shit. I think that's <laughs> the best thing we can teach our children is emotional resiliency. Yeah. Because look, we all turned out fine. There is an amount to which I hope I raise resilient kids that are bullied and still turn out just fine. Yeah, I think some to some degree we need more bullying and uh, it would make America a lot better country if more people were bullied because less people would think they have the... Yeah, make America bully again because people would have less audacity to be fucking... (laughs) Jackie Paris, Jacqueline Paris, thank you so much for coming on my podcast today. I can't begin to explain how excited I was to have this conversation. It met my expectations and more. I'm just so, so marvelously happy that you came on and, and had this chat. I'm just not even remotely surprised at your success as a human being and as a mother. And I'm just super happy for who you turned out to be. It's not a surprise at all. I've got a very cheesy line. If you've been on my podcast, you're part of my family. So you're now an honorary Pachuto. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a real treat. Yeah. Thanks for having me. No problem. Take care. Thanks.